One thing about reviewing products that I don't think I was really expecting is the hype that surrounds new releases. And this Tab Ultra C Pro was one of the most hyped releases that I've been involved in. Okay, after the Kindle Scribe. Did it disappoint? Well, as you'll see in this first part of the video, I was so excited to get it out of the box. I actually made this first video, I think in just an hour and a half. It's probably one of the best, quickest made videos that I've ever done because I had four burning questions and I had four questions that had come to me from the audience repeatedly and I just wanted to get those answers and get those answers out there. I wasn't disappointed. I wasn't disappointed at all. It's a fantastic e-ink tablet and I still think that objectively you can make a case for this being the very best. I think objectively you can make a case for the Tab Ultra C Pro as being the one e-ink tablet that can even come close to replacing your laptop. It's the one e-ink tablet that if you just had one device this would be the choice for you. Well, in this video, we're gonna go through my whole journey from getting the Tab Ultra C Pro out of the box to my deeper understanding of it after having used it for multiple weeks at work. It is currently what I'm daily driving, although well, I'm going to make some content next about using the Note Air 3C for work, and you'll see me compare and discuss those two releases. They are both released at the same time. They both have the same Kaleido 3 screen, although they do have different specifications. And the biggest distinguishing factor is the fact that this has that keyboard case. I really think that by the end of this video, you're gonna have a great understanding of my use case with the Tab Ultra C Pro, and whether it's gonna fit into your use case more importantly. And I spend a lot of time making sure this content looks as good and sounds as good as possible. So why not just share it up to your 4K Smart TV, sit back with a snack and a drink, and really enjoy this content. Let's dive in to the unboxing. This just arrived and I know a lot of you have been waiting for this before you go ahead and buy one of either the Tab Ultra C Pro, which is in this box, or the Note Air 3C. I've been using the Note Air 3C at work this week and I've been really enjoying it. I still find, when I'm at home, I still find that I am going to the Tab Ultra C, the original, which is my previous best e-ink tablet. I still find that I use that for typing. I much prefer using that for making written documents than the Note Air 3C. So let's find out. There's a valid choice for the Note Air 3C, absolutely, that you could use a external keyboard, a Bluetooth keyboard and use it in this portrait mode. And I really like that as well. But this is the Tab Ultra C Pro. Incidentally, right after this, I'm gonna go ahead and film a testing video and then I'm gonna go ahead and film a side-by-side -side Note Air 3C. So if you wanna see the testing video, that's gonna be a members only. It's just gonna be me trying out a few things straight after this video. The Tab Ultra C Pro does have the faster processor and it does have the compatibility for the keyboard case. It's the same Kaleido free screen though. Legal stuff, Pen2 Pro and a USB-C cable. I'm going to answer four questions that people have been asking me on my videos featuring this tablet so far. Does it feel faster? What does the screen feel like? Does the hinge work well on the keyboard case? Does the trackpad get in the way while typing? Hello. Let's have a little look around it though as well. The smart scanner does look better than previous, though I know people, a lot of people aren't going to want to see it there at all. Still got the, the design on there, slightly embossed. It's a B, double O, and then X. And the pogo pins are now on the back whereas they were on the bottom of the device before. And that's because when I get out of the keyboard case, it connects in a slightly different setup. So first one, does it feel faster? Yes. Yes, it does. I am pretty sure that is gonna be another improvement on the latency testing when we see what Voyeur has to say about that. What is the screen feel like? Unsurprisingly, it is not as textured as the Note F3C. It is the same screen feel as the Tab Ultra C, and that's not a bad screen feel. I personally wouldn't want to kick it out of bed. I actually think that there is merit in the clarity of the non-textured and non-matte screen feel, and it is doing a decent job of handling reflections. They aren't really specular. They're still quite diffuse like that. Some of the differences straight away, you can see it's got also volume buttons yeah. on the side as well. There's a fingerprint reader as usual up there as well. So now the keyboard case, which is the biggest distinction between this and the Note Air 3C. It is quite heavy, you can tell without even taking it out of his box, you can tell that's going to be quite heavy. And this is what makes it a productivity device rather than a purely note-taking device. A little cardboard case containing the foam insert there. A bit of needless extra packaging. And this time they've included a trackpad as well, which have Quite a stiff hinge. We expect it to just flip back, but now it's a pretty stiff hinge. And then that's not a very stiff hinge. Interesting. So let's have a go typing it. Does the new hinge work well? <laughs> it is a pretty stiff hinge. Oh, I see. There's a bar there that it rotates around. So initially I'm saying yeah, because that's managing to 
sit in some different positions quite well. And then trackpad. I haven't accidentally pressed the trackpad at all so far, so that's good. So my next question was, does the trackpad get in the way while typing? Not yet. And even so, it's kind of like, I don't feel like I'm gonna accidentally press it and it's gonna kind of take away and move it to a different position because once you start typing, yes, yeah, so the cursor kind of goes away after a moment and then you're not so likely to accidentally click. And that's the thing that's gonna be annoying. It's not an accidental kind of motion. It's if you accidentally click when you're typing. It doesn't seem to be happening so far. And as always, I do love the book so you can do voice input as well whilst typing. And then use the keyboard really for editing that work as well. In any case, the trackpad can be disabled through the settings and then physical keyboard dialog in the settings box. So that's all for this video. I'm just going to get it myself logged in and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to do a quick testing video just with this camera and that's gonna be available for members. So if you're interested in membership, you can see that by the join button down below. That'll be up very soon if it's not up already. And I'm also going to do a comparison between this, the Note Air 3C, and a comparison between this and the older Tab Ultra. If this video was all you needed just to make up your mind, then please check in the description for the affiliate links, which really do help out with the channel and just mean that I have more time, therefore, to make more content for you. So thanks very much for watching the video. And I will be back also this evening with a live stream. So please go ahead and comment any more questions that you have, and I'll try and cover them there. So that was a bit of a surprise. I was really expecting to have nothing but positive things to say, but I guess I'd already said those positive things about the Tab Ultra C. The Tab Ultra C had been for some time what I would consider to be the best e-ink tablet out there. And I still think it's an amazing e-ink device, which I'm not sure you really need to upgrade to the pro version just because of that. Books were criticized quite a lot for bringing out devices quite quickly and for discontinuing old ones. Whilst I can see the frustration with that, with a device you bought only six months ago as the flagship no longer being the flagship, books are continued to update all of their devices for at least three years after their launch. And of course, the other criticism they'd had leveled at them quite a lot, being that they were stuck on Android 11, they'd solved that and gone to Android 12. Though I do wonder whether there might be some slight stability issues with going up to Android 12. So if you're here wondering whether you need to update to the latest Tab Ultra C Pro from the Tab Ultra C, the short answer is no, I don't think you need to upgrade. I don't think you necessarily need to upgrade. I actually don't think that that's what this latest iteration is about. I just think they've decided not to continue another Tab Ultra C production line given the improvements they've made here. I think that might have been just because the parts weren't available. I just think it wasn't worth them keeping two devices that are really quite similar in this line. I think that you do have to understand that Onyx Books is a smaller company, a different type of company to your Samsungs or your Apples. They're much more niche. They're going to do much more limited product runs and that will perhaps be governed by the availability of parts. So when they've got some new processes in, I think they've decided to make a new iteration of the device. Discontinued this and it sounds like we're saying, well, that's obsolete now, but that isn't really the case as I hope I'm gonna show in this video. And I have addressed that issue in other videos, but here I'm just gonna show you some features of both and some differences. I'm gonna talk about how I actually find that in use. And honestly, straight away, I can tell you the actual use of the two devices isn't all that different at all. Of course, there are improvements from the Tab Ultra C to the Tab Ultra C Pro, and I will talk about those, but it isn't night and day here. And the first one I'll talk about is the keyboard case. Possibly the most obvious difference. This is certainly a physical difference between the two. And honestly, if you're going to buy one of these devices over one of the other excellent devices that books make, then the keyboard case is the reason to do that. They have changed the way that the dock works. So before, they had the pogo pins on the base of the keyboard, which is the physical connection between the tablet and the keyboard case. They had it at the bottom of the device. And people were complaining that they actually got accidental disconnections, and I didn't really get that. But I think that's because they were holding the device and moving around like this, rather than as I do by just holding it by the base. And you can see I've actually had a disconnection just there, so maybe there is a point to that after all. But that for me certainly wasn't a big issue. This one has the pogo pins attached to the back of the device, which means that they're always connected and it should be less likely to come out of this connected mode. Then there is also the trackpad. It's moving this keyboard back on the device has made room for a trackpad. And the trackpad is just fine. You do need to remember to switch into fast mode to have smooth operation of the cursor there. And you can change the cursor speed in the settings, and I've set it to about two thirds speed, which I find just fine. That's a nice to have, and for some apps it can be really useful. Of course, what you could have done is carried around some type of wireless mouse, 
or indeed the USB-C mouse, and you can still use a mouse on the Tab Ultra C. That would have been totally acceptable. While I was writing this little comparison next tiles, it was really nice to be able to click in different places in the text, but also to click and drag and make new tiles. So that's quite cool. Another benefit of the keyboard case and the keyboard being in a new position is where the magnetic rail is. So there's a magnetic rail here right in the middle of this keyboard. And that means there's a magnet right down the middle here, which gives you in drawing, it gives you lots of wobble as you go across that point. If I go ahead and make a line, you see the wobble where the rail is? So that's no good. Now there's no magnetic rail at all, so you don't get that wobble in the drawing app. However, there is another disadvantage here. So at the time of writing this at least, there's no way to disengage the keyboard case when you fold it over this way. So now, unfortunately, I'm still, I can get accidental key presses here, and you can see I've accidentally brought up the cursor there as well. So it's not just uncomfortable because you can feel the keys on the back, and it's not just heavier because it's in the notebook style and you've got an extra half a kilogram worth of keyboard case. You're also accidentally pressing those keys and the trackpad. I expect that Books will solve this and bring some type of software update to allow you to disengage the keyboard automatically when it's important portrait mode, for example, but it really should have been considered at launch. Another kind of difference with the keyboard cases is they have used a more premium sort of faux leather on this new Pro case. It does give it a bit more of a premium feeling. And you can now fold it up into various orientations. You can hold that screen up at different angles now. I didn't really find that I didn't like the faux leather here. You can see it's not as premium as some cases, you know, doesn't bear comparison really to the faux leather on the Remarkable case, for example. That's a lot more expensive though. But it is a nice improvement and they've advertised it as being really fingerprint free. Also, they've improved the keycaps. They're slightly nicer material as well. Although I do find that actually there's more travel on the previous keyboard than there is on this one. I'm gonna say it's about an extra half a millimeter of travel on this one, which is not a deal breaker, but I find that I actually prefer typing on the previous keyboard. But both of them are just fine. There's also a slight issue I find with the spacebar. I find that the spacebar just needs quite a solid press. And my normal kind of tap with the thumb just isn't always actuating the spacebar. So that's weird. It's a little bit annoying, but I'm just getting used to it and I'm pressing the spacebar a bit more firmly. So they're both really pleasant places to type on. I wouldn't want to type on them for hours and hours, not like a full-size mechanical keyboard. But both of them are just useful for this use case, which is using the voice recognition and then pausing it and going ahead and making your edits. I've actually found the Google voice typing keyboard to be really useful as well. And actually that works better with the keyboard for edits afterwards because on the book's voice typing keyboard, the spacebar actually starts and stops the voice recognition. And for some reason, I found that the voice recognition on the book's keyboard didn't work whilst it was charging, weird. I did wonder if the trackpad would get in the way whilst typing. It is quite big, which is nice. And I did think that I would be accidentally hitting it with my thumb or my palms, but I'm not having a whole lot of issues with that very occasionally. And this trackpad does have gestures. So it's got two fingers scroll like you'd expect. It's got three fingers up for the home page, and it's got two fingers down for back. That's not gonna do anything there. It's got four fingers for a screenshot. First time trying it to click. It hasn't worked at all, I don't think. So that's my first time trying that, and it hasn't worked, so. But the three finger left and right for switching between apps does. That's nice. And you can scroll right and left and up and down, left and right, and you can pinch to zoom in certain apps as well and click and drag. So it's got your normal range of trackpad gestures. And these can be useful if you simply take the time to learn them, which I haven't yet. The new hinge on the back is very good. It's very stiff, although time will tell whether that does weaken over time. I think it'll be okay though. You do need a slightly longer lap now to put this in your lap. <laughs> Whereas this was actually quite nice in your lap. And lastly, with the keyboard, they've added a little LED in the caps lock so you know when that's on or off, which is very welcome. Oh yeah, and they have added a few shortcuts. So they've added a shortcut to the e-ink center, a shortcut to split screen, which I really like. They have to be an app which supports it. That's really nice to switch there, although I wish it would switch straight back. You can just clear it like that, it's cool. And a search shortcut as well. And I really like having the color temperature shortcuts here on the keyboard and the brightness shortcuts as well. All cool things. That was there on the previous one as well, although they've just moved. I would like to see a shortcut to disable the trackpad as well for those accidental pre presses. 
and you can maybe make that a shortcut to disable the keyboard because you're going to turn it over or something. All of this signifies a direction of travel from books into a more laptop format, into a PC form factor. I think the future is really bright with that. So other physical features of the Pro model versus the original Tab Ultra C. Firstly, the Pro model is ever so slightly thinner. It's not going to make any difference in your daily use really, but there is sort of 0.6 I think of a millimeter difference between the two. They've also added volume buttons, which that's welcome and you can assign them to different functions in the settings menu there as well. You can choose between volume, page turn or scrolling. But you see I have set them to page turn for Kindle and they aren't doing that so it's not perfect. I don't even think they'll be in a good position for page turn anyway. I don't think they're that important for me although it is nice to be able to just quickly kill the volume when you move into a place with other people and you don't want to disturb them. And it's a device that 90% of the time anyway, I use with no volume on at all. In the Pro model, they've also reduced the battery size. Although that has reduced the weight slightly and also made it slightly thinner, I think that may prove to have been a poor decision as the new chips are not, as I was hoping, more friendly on the battery. If anything, they're more power hungry. It's gone from 6,300 milliamp hours to 4,600 milliamp hours. And in my opinion, the reduction in weight, which is 30 grams, is not worth that loss of battery life. You're already committing to carrying around a heavy device here, and that isn't gonna make a huge impact on my back muscles. They've also added more RAM, which is of course very welcome. And I find that in use, that just means generally there is more available RAM at any given point, although I'm managing to almost max out that six gigs right now. You can still see that in its app switcher at least, there's more free space available. And that does make things like Chrome run a bit more smoothly. And it should make switching between apps that little bit quicker, which you can see there. The camera housing looks slightly different. We've got this kind of clear plastic one on here which has always been for some reason misaligned. And you've just got this keyed in color plastic, which is now nicely aligned. But I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same or a very similar camera within there. And that camera is perfectly fine for its intended use case, which is scanning documents. The screen is exactly the same. It's the Kaleido free screen, but the higher processing power in the Pro is getting a little bit more out of the book's super refresh technology. Show Chrome on both of them. For some reason, Chrome never shows on the homepage on the older one, but it does on the new one. Let's change off this example of Man United losing and look at the latest example of Man United losing. Why not? Let's blame VAR, of course, and let's make sure we're both in the same settings. So you can see, actually, you're getting smoother scrolling here on the Pro model there. And then into Fast. What the BSR does is it kind of uses a few extra local refreshes to clear up images, it's cleared quicker on the newer device. So actually, yes, the faster processor is having a good effect on the book super refresh technology. Let's have a look at various other apps then. So go into notes. No, it feels pretty much exactly the same, but maybe navigating some of the menus might be. Yeah, it feels pretty similar to be honest. You can see it just gets there slightly quicker actually in that example of opening, download and open a PDF, but it looks identical. I think maybe that first press is a little bit better on the Tab Ultra C Pro though. Yeah, it's a little bit quicker for that first press. And lastly, switching between apps. Yeah, a bit faster on the newer device. And that's what you would expect with that new chipset, but this isn't slow, it's just side by side, you can tell. That's the one reason, if any, to upgrade to the Pro model. The system on chip is just much faster. In terms of the benchmarks, it's night and day. The Tab Ultra C is running a Snapdragon 665 processor. It's got four cores, two are two gigahertz, and four which are 1.8 gigahertz. The Tab Ultra C Pro has a Snapdragon 855 chip with one core at 2.8 gigahertz and three at 2.4 gigahertz and four efficiency cores at 1.8 gigahertz. So that means that the efficiency cores on the Pro are almost as fast as the higher performance cores on the previous generation. I have noticed the difference in the speed moving between apps on the Pro model versus the previous model. And you will benefit from that if you're finding out that you're just maxing out the Tab Ultra C. However, the only reason I'm noticing that is because I'm testing them out side by side. I would say that I've been totally happy with the performance on the Tab Ultra C, totally happy with 
with the speed. And you need to seriously ask yourself if you really do need that extra speed or if you're just happy with it the way it is. So I hope that helps. Let me know in the comments below if you've got any more questions and I'll try and feature them in my more content. One more physical thing, which is <laughs> I've not mentioned here, hasn't actually bothered me a lot. People have talked about this like as having a knife edge edge, not something that's bothered me in the slightest. But they have taken the time to slightly tool down the edge on the newer version because that's what books do. They do respond to people's complaints. They do listen to your feedback. And thank you very much. I certainly listen to feedback as well. So please chuck any of it in the comments below. And it is still true that I do use the tab old receipt, which is the original. And that's mainly just because the apps are already installed and logged in there. I was just continuing to use. But my point is that I'm still using that and not thinking, gosh, this is nowhere near as good as the pro model is. But next is the bigger debate in my mind is the Note F3C or the tab old receipt pro. One of them's got to be the best eating tablet out there for sure and the other one's got to be second place so which is going to be top gun features here that I use on the Tab Ultra C Pro mean that I hardly ever use a laptop now. Okay, I do have to use the school laptop at work, but aside from that, I only really use my own laptop when I travel. And even then, I only really use it for video editing on the go. I consider myself a writer, and this is the format for that. But listen, this Note F3C might just suit me better. And there are lots of reasons why, in fact, I'm still wrestling between these two for which is the best eating tablet right now. You'll find links to both of them in the description right below the like button, which if you could just click that now, that would really help the video spread and be more useful to more people. But I find with the Books keyboard or indeed the Google voice recognition keyboard, it's a really, really good place to work on words. I use the voice recognition and then I use the keyboard for editing. I'm gonna settle down here at this big computer on this desk or if I am writing, then I'm gonna be able to find any comfortable spot in my house with this and I can switch between this laptop mode or a more note-taking style, just seamlessly. It's a really compelling place. If you're like me, if you write first, if whatever your professional use case is, if you're someone that needs to write to get your ideas out, to plan things, to share ideas, to lead, inform, create, or educate, or any other professional task, then I would argue this is the thing for you, the Tab Ultra C Pro. That being said, there are still plenty of arguments for the Note F3C. This vertical case, and then just hook it up with an ergonomic Bluetooth keyboard when needed. But for me, carrying that keyboard case just means that I have a pleasant place to write wherever I am. But that is a thought, <laughs> because with the keyboard case attached, you've pretty much doubled the weight of this device. And you're looking at carrying around a device which is a kilogram for the privilege of being able to type in laptop mode on e -Ink. But it does enable me to be more productive in work apps wherever I am. It's not just typing, it's also things like spreadsheets are just working much more seamlessly with that keyboard case. And I've got more power in the Tab Ultra C Pro, I've got more RAM for switching between apps, and there's some really well thought out keyboard shortcuts as well. I really like the split screen button and I like the app switching gesture as well. You can of course use full Android apps or desktop versions of web apps in Chrome. And the trackpad comes in handy there because things in web apps often are more attuned to use with a mouse and keyboard. And one of the most common questions I get asked about eInk is, can it integrate with my Google Drive or my OneDrive? Well, both can. But the Tab Ultra C Pro is the better format for working on those apps. The trackpad is good, but don't forget to add just a little bit of sensitivity in the settings and switch to a fast or ultra fast mode when you are using the cursor. I pretty much write directly into whichever app I need to, and I can type, or I can use the voice recognition, or I can use the handwriting recognition. I can do that and any mix of the three on both devices, and both of them make that a real pleasure. But what you should do is consider which of those three inputs you're more likely to enjoy using, and which you're gonna be using more of the time, and then make your decision decision based on that. The Note F3C is going to be more of a pleasure for using the handwriting recognition. Pretty scruffy at the end there. 
whereas the Ultra Pro is the better place for typing. Let's talk about the design evolution now, and really to find out where things are going, well, you'll find out more about my thoughts of that towards the end of the video, so stick around. If we go back in time, the very first Kindle had a keyboard, and I remember thinking, of how wonderful a place it could be to write on. Even though you'd have to write with your thumbs and those keys would be really small and you wouldn't be quite as quick as typing on a keyboard. And then my mum got one and I wanted one, but you know, it was a bit unattainable for me as a young man. But I thought, wow, that would be great for me. I'd love to write on that. That small portable form factor with the words coming up as if they were already printed on paper. And then I got the chance to try my mum's Kindle and I was very disappointed because there was no real place where you could just write text. There was no word processor. In any case, it was slow and it was quite unpleasant to use. So that horrible little keyboard, it vanished from the next models. And I remember thinking what a waste that was and how that could have been such a great feature to have. A feature that would make e-readers something great for writers like me. The buttons were really mushy as well. Generally, it just wasn't really good. But fast forward and now e-ink is much faster and the type does appear on screen as you hit the keys. And there isn't really a notable lag between that and writing on a normal computer. The ink is now a really nice place to type on. People who use that generation of Kindle, even though it's a horrible place to type, they still loved having the keyboard there, even if it was just to be able to write the titles into search or to make those quick annotations as they were reading. And the on-screen keyboards that followed were never good enough. They were never responsive enough. Fast forward to today and our live stream debate between these two devices, it focused on the text input and in particular, the physical keyboards and different typing setups. Now, okay, I have to concede that I lost the debate, but it was really fascinating to have heard everyone's opinions as well. So if you want to stop here, it might be enough to know that for most people, the Note Air 3C seems to be the choice. But watch on because I'm not so sure it's so cut and dry. It's not hard to see why the Note Air 3C is so popular. There is just an excellent writing experience. It's light, it's got that excellent color ink screen, it's clear, it's fast, it feels good. It's got really low reflectivity. It's got a great notes app with great tools, great Android operating system. It's got a fingerprint reader now as well. It's got a great case that can stand up in that upright position. And that portrait mode is really nice for typing. And most Android apps are actually set up better for portrait mode than they are for landscape mode. You don't really have that option here with the Tab Ultra C Pro. If you were to set up a place in your house with a Bluetooth keyboard and a Bluetooth mouse right next to it, that you could sort of dock your Note Air 3C when you came in and just flick on the Bluetooth and be typing and using the cursor, that could be a really compelling use case. However, life isn't always like that and you're not always in the same place. Whereas I find that wherever I am with this, I can just open up into the laptop mode and get into that zone with writing just as I can at home. You should really watch that live stream. It was really good. And of course it'll be linked up in the description. And when you're out and about and when you're traveling and you want to take one device with you and you want that to be e-ink, the Tab Ultra C Pro is the choice for that. It's absolutely brilliant. And I think that's the thing that will still be swaying it for me. I just want to carry this one thing. And I rarely take a laptop with me now. I can just do so much between my phone and this e-ink tablet. Even photo editing, I'll do that on my phone. Really, it's just full on Photoshop and Premiere Pro that I need to have that laptop with me when I travel. And often I've decided I'm not gonna do those things when I'm on holiday. And this is a device that can replace those other laptop things. Sitting and typing, accessing the internet, email, managing cloud apps. We're getting closer to a desktop capable device here. There was one other comment which I thought was a really good one, which is that somebody just needs to make a good quality Bluetooth keyboard case for this. And all of a sudden we don't have much of an argument for the Tab Ultra C Pro really. So balls in your court, Logi. I had thought that the Tab Ultra C Pro was going to just blow away the competition. But looking back, there are a lot of people who when the Tab Ultra and the Tab Ultra C came out, they straight away said that they were waiting for the next in the Note Air line. They were waiting, they said at the time, for the Note Air 3C. So it's no surprise really that people aren't as excited about the Tab Ultra C Pro because it is a smaller, more incremental upgrade from the Tab Ultra C. Even though the power is a vast difference in everyday use, you don't notice that so much. It hasn't shattered all expectations. Whereas for fans of the Note Air line, it is a big jump up from the Note Air 2 Plus. Both of these tablets are running the book Super Refresh technology, which clears up the screen without doing full refreshes. It means less ghosting. And that does have a downside, which means that you get a much higher energy draw from the battery. I think that you can just about see that it is smoother and clearer on the Tab Ultra C Pro though. 
but it isn't night and day. I do this demonstration quite a bit, but you can just see the ghosting vanish in an app like Chrome. And even though the battery size is bigger on the Tab Ultra C Pro, the battery life is not going to be really any difference between the two. It appears to be a bit more of a power hungry system on chip on the Pro. Both of these devices are using that high refresh rate color in panel, and that just costs you dearly when you're talking about your battery life. Expect around a 15% drop per hour if you're using a productivity app. It does just take more power to shift that ink up and down in the ink capsules more often. It also takes power to clear that ghosting in the white space. You do want that, but unfortunately, I don't think there's gonna be any way of getting around it that is gonna take more of your battery. You can get a battery battery life though if you go into and you just generally use HD mode and if you purely use reading apps. Now we're doing single page turns and even if you were to disable things like page turn animations or turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, then you would get slightly better battery life. Essentially, the fewer times that it's refreshing the screen, the better the battery life. And you can also try your best to run it at a lower screen brightness. You will also get better battery life there. This will give you something in the order of 5% drop per hour. It is what it is. The Tab Ultra C Pro is the more power hungry device and you will end up using it for more power hungry activities. Your Note Air 3C is more of a reader and note taker. But even the note taking app, unfortunately, is quite intense on the battery. And you'll enjoy it because there are still other big benefits of using e -ink. First of all, there's that reflective screen. So it's using ambient light most of the time or a little bit of front light when necessary. That makes eye comfort great. It's great for outdoors when there's lots of light and you can turn the lights right off. And I still hear a lot of reviewers, probably who are more used to talking about ordinary screens, talking about how the lights can go really bright and that's bright enough for outdoors. You don't need the lights at all when you're outdoors. It's great for reading, but it's also great for working with any app involving text. It's not great for video. You can use it as a push, but that's not what it's intended for. And that will be one of the most battery intensive activities. This is not the end point of this technology. And I can't wait for the book super refresh technology to go into your larger static productivity devices. They aren't going to need charging, so battery life won't be a thing or of course, more laptop styles with bigger batteries. I can't wait for books to upgrade their mirror line to include large screen color ink. It's got to be coming soon, right? I still do think this is the one for me though, the Tab Ultra C Pro. This is the one that personally I'm going to enjoy using more. It's not just because of the keyboard case, but also it's got higher RAM, that's gonna do better with switching between different apps and having the pointer there all of the time for when that touch just isn't quite precise enough. Yeah, it's better. But you have to consider which is better for you. Are you wanting a device that's gonna sit next door to a laptop or a computer? Well, for the same price as the Tab Ultra C Pro in its keyboard case, you could actually get a Note F3C and, you know, around a sort of 200 pound Chromebook. I'm not saying the 200 pound Chromebook is going to be perfect, but you could probably get more done productivity wise on that setup than you can on just a Tab Ultra C Pro. So just before I reveal which of these e-ink tablets I think for now at least is going to be my choice as best e-ink tablet, which you can buy right now, can I ask, if this has been useful to you, can you share it? Just click the share button, copy and paste the link into wherever you discuss eating tablets. Or if you can't think of where you'd put that or who to send that to, then go ahead and leave a comment telling me what you think about these two great devices. Those interactions really have a positive effect on how the video spreads on YouTube. So thanks very much for watching and supporting the channel. So objections to the Tab Ultra C Pro are that it's not as light and it's not got the screen feel of the Note Air 3 c It's not for holding in the hand, but I find the smoother screen actually gives it more clarity. The Note Air 3 c will be better on a tabletop for note taking. It's a little bit thinner and it won't wobble as much. Whereas the Tab Ultra C Pro is that bit thicker. You can't really lie it flat out of its case because of the camera bump, which means it's always gonna wobble around. So you have to use a case of some description, either the keyboard case or the simple case. But the Tab Ultra C Pro would be better on a table in laptop mode. The screen feel is absolutely fine on the Tab Ultra C Pro. It's not quite as rough, but it isn't like an iPad. It doesn't feel hard. It gives to the brush it does have something of a frictiony feel, just not quite to the level of the Note Air 3C. That difference isn't that important in my eyes. The biggest difference though is that I don't actually think that this Tab Ultra C Pro is a complete design yet. I still think it's a bit of a work in progress. It's not the end point of that design iteration. It's not a mature design. It's not the tablet PC that it's built as. It's another step towards that, towards an e-ink productivity future. So I can imagine a prospective device which is maybe running a full desktop OS where images and text look perfect 
aspect and all apps work seamlessly. And in a way, if you want a true productivity powerhouse on e-ink, this isn't it yet. There's still lots to be ironed out in this design. And if you buy this now, you'll probably want the next one and the next one as quite rapidly books iterate and improve that design. Remember this concept is a category which is only really a year old. The Note Air 3C, however, if you want a digital notebook, it's complete. It's a mature design and it represents the best of one e-ink note taker should be. You'll buy it and it'll do that job for the next three to five years perfectly. But then so did the Note Air 1 or any of the previous generation. But if you like to be at the bleeding edge, if you want tech, which is currently the best, if you want to experience what e-ink can currently offer, the choice is clear. And when you get the Tab Ultra C Pro, you lose basically nothing of the Note Air 3C. It can do all the same, just more. If you want the best, then this is the best. I'm really still not sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do another top 10 ranked video soon, so stay tuned for that and I will have made up my mind and I'll stick to it after that. Of course, making all this content, especially the live streams, I get a lot of feedback from you guys in the audience and I really enjoy that because it helps me make better content. And there are some criticisms that are leveled at books. In this next section, I'm gonna tackle four of them and then I'll talk about one straight after as well. So I'm really positive about Onyx Books devices. They're excellent e ink tablets. And in honesty, if I wasn't a reviewer, then these are the ones I would be buying. For full transparency, they do send me these devices in order to review them, but we've never had any agreement beyond an NDA so that I can produce content ready for launch days. They've never paid me to say anything. I'm simply impressed by the way they handle e-ink tablets. But today I want to address some common gripes with books, some common comments that people make on my channel and that I hear of complaints about their devices. And all of these four, I understand them all, but I do think they're occasionally made into bigger deals than they actually are. So to start with, it's battery life. I'm afraid that currently this seems to be a trade-off with the high refresh rate technology that they're using, the book super refresh technology they call it. And that gives us ultra clarity and high refresh rates and no other company is managing to do that as well. In fact, using devices with Kaleido free from other companies, I can tell you the books is streets ahead. And the battery life in those other devices actually seems to be lower. It is worth checking out Jeffrey Moss's video where he's done some comparisons of the battery life on the books Note Air 3C and in various different devices. And he's used different scenarios, different use cases, putting different strains onto the battery. There's two key takeaways. There's quite intense strain for videos and for browsing and much less for e-reader apps. There's a pretty intense strain for the note taking app as well. And there's a much higher consumption when moving between 50% brightness to 100% brightness. Understanding physics, then that doesn't surprise me. Things like productivity apps where you are using high refresh rates or browsing or video, you are refreshing that screen and moving those e-ink capsules many more times per second than just the single refresh of a page turn, for instance. So do check out that video, I'll put it in the description. But for now, know that essentially your battery life will vary depending on how you use the device. Personally, I'm finding that if I was to use it all day intensively, then I would have to charge it at the end of the day. But if I was just using it for reading, then I would probably get several days out of it. For my normal use, which is sort of sporadic, occasionally referencing it for notes, occasionally using a productivity app, probably a total screen usage time of about two to three hours a day. That's lasting me three days really. The next one is Android versions. Now it is a really common criticism to criticize books for not being on the latest Android version. And the latest books devices are on Android 12 and the previous ones are all stuck on Android 11. And okay, that is an issue. But if it was an easy thing to do to upgrade to the latest Android, I think the books would do it. I think there's a trade-off here for books using system on chips which are three years old. They're usually using processors that are three years behind the current sort of mid-range chips. And that's a sensible thing to do because you don't need quite the cutting edge power on an e-ink tablet. And that will bring the price down from where it would be. I know they're expensive, but that's because of the e-ink screen rather than the internals. I don't think that books are doing that because they don't care or they can't be bothered. In fact, I think it would be an easier job for them if they were just able to keep them all on the latest Android. Next. It's a really big one, security concerns. So security online, it comes from lots of things. Use of two-factor authentication, for instance, in your apps. Use a screen lock. 
Use complex and different passwords in all of your different apps. Be really careful around phishing emails and installing apps from unknown sources. Do all that and you will keep yourself secure online. For some time now, Android has been pretty secure. It's the soft switch of it that tends to open the door for bad actors to get into your tablet. But the main complaint comes from a bit of a presumption that the Chinese government is spying on us all. Sure, there is likely to be some mass data collection going on in China. I've no doubt that's the case. But I've also no doubt that that's going on in Western governments too. Books devices are now Google Play protected. So they run the Google Play Store as standard and all of your apps and accounts are managed by that. If there were serious issues to the security, then Google would not be certifying these devices. And Google Play Protect services are always updated, even on much older versions of Android. I also noticed that other large Chinese tech companies don't seem to have the same criticism leveled at them as books. I don't want to name names, but those larger tech companies are trusted implicitly. And so much of our tech is produced in China. Books has taken the steps to reduce the risk, and now all of your data on your books account can be stored on a server either in the US or the EU. Crucially, if the books account is on a US server, it sends data to the US, not China. If it's on an EU server, then it sends data to the EU. So make sure when you first log into the device and you create an account that you select either the US or the EU server. And if you're still worried, then you could simply enjoy the tablet just as much never having signed into a books account. You can still back up all your data and your notes to Google Drive or whatever cloud service you like. And also I've had no issue with giving my organization some permissions for managing books devices. So that allows me to have work profile Microsoft apps here. Again, if there were big risks, then I do trust that Microsoft would have those things flagged and they would not be allowing the devices anywhere near their cloud services. That being said, if you are working with very highly valuable and sensitive information on your tablet, perhaps sticking to whichever devices are supplied by your organization, that's better. Lastly, it's planned obsolescence. And this has come to the fore very recently with removing the Tab Ultra and putting the Tab Ultra C Pro. It's become a bit of a joke about the names of the next generation of books devices. What do you think is coming next in the comments? And whilst I do understand the frustration, I sort of take exception to the assertion that Books is making the previous generation of devices obsolete by making a new device. Your Tab Ultra C is still working just as well as it was when you bought it. I suppose that we're used to Apple and Samsung who release all of the models of iPhone and Galaxy phone at the same time and say, here are this year's models if you want to upgrade or skip. And when they do that, you have the chance to jump in then and there and get the best of the best for a full year, or you can wait for the deals to come, knowing that the device will be only the best until the same time next year. So there's a kind of predictable churn of knowing when new devices are coming out. But those are massive companies with huge design teams and huge distribution teams who know what features they're expecting in their devices, in their models, two or three years down the line. You can't really expect the same from a company which I think Books has about 20 employees, although probably a few more now that their products are gaining in popularity. The way that I think that Books are operating is a pretty quick turnover of idea into design, into release, into evaluate and then iterate. And this is why there's often limited stock available in the devices which are only a year or so old. Or in the case with the Books Tab Ultra C where they straight up and said, yeah, we aren't making any more of this device, but we've improved it. And I think there's also limited availability of that Clyde free screen. And so they're thinking, well, we've only got so many of these, we might as well put them into the best devices we can make right now. So I do stand by what I said, love the one that you're with. If you're a proud owner of a Tab Ultra or Tab Ultra C, it's excellent. And the Pro model is just an iteration, a little bit of improvement on that. It has not made your device obsolete. Probably you ought to skip this generation. So unless you know that there's a new feature that's gonna make a big difference in your workflow, just watch Books Innovate. Enjoy the little bit of an e-ink war we have going on right now and hope that it will eventually drive the price right down and there'll be great devices available for everyone at every price point soon. And also know that Books plan to bring you updates for at least three years after the launch of a device. And so those new software features, you won't have to wait long for them to come to your device. I hope that helps. I'm really interested in your opinion and what your take on all those things are. For what it's worth, that's my take on it all. So in the latest update on the Books Tab Ultra C Pro, it gave me a privacy policy and it asked me to read through that. And that was essentially making the device compliant with GDPR.
It even went as far as appointing a data protection officer, somebody who was responsible for looking after the data that you send up to the books server that I'm using. I'm currently using the EU server on one device and I'm using the US server currently on this device. And so books is at least taking it seriously, the new data protection laws that we have in the West. And I think that's really quite important. It should at least go some way to making people feel safer about trusting their data to books. If you're worried about them phoning home as people put it to China well I can say that it is the case that it sends your data to whichever of the three servers you choose the Chinese server the EU server or the US server that is where your data is going that's where it's being stored I don't think you have to worry on those accounts I hope that section of the video was useful to you in any case so whenever I make a review I always use the devices for a minimum of two weeks at work and I have now been using this for I think almost six weeks at work and I've really enjoyed it. I've loved it. It did live up to the hype. I do wonder because I have to use my work laptop, I do wonder if a more note style of device is more suited to that purpose. In which case perhaps I would sacrifice having the keyboard case and go with the ordinary folio case. That would mean that it would slip in and out of the bag that little bit more easily because the keyboard case doesn't just add another half a kilogram of weight. <laughs> Sorry another half kilogram of mass. It also makes it that bit thicker and it's a bit harder to get it in and out of any laptop sleeve in a bag. So consider that if you want to go for the Tab Ultra C Pro, is it worth getting it along with its ordinary folio case as well as the keyboard case? Or of course, and it's so hard to resist making that comparison with the Note Air 3C, the much thinner and lighter device here. And books have just released the Note Air 3, which is the black and white companion edition to this. Check that one out also. And that's about $100 cheaper than the Note Air 3C and considerably cheaper than the Tab Ultra C Pro. The Tab Ultra C Pro. Now when I make these reviews, I make a set of comparison data and wow, I didn't actually feel the need to upgrade any of the professional behavior scores from this device, the Tab Ultra C Pro, from the Tab Ultra C. And that just shows you that in many ways it's just a small upgrade. It is a performance boost, a slight reduction in thickness, nicer materials and finish. In many other ways though, it's a massive performance boost. And when you look at the benchmarks side by side, it looks like a massive difference, but this isn't making for a massive change in how you can use the device. You can see these differences when you have the two devices side by side. But the thing is, you're not going to miss those few milliseconds when you change apps, unless you directly have them side by side to compare. I do have that video, but this isn't that. After you've watched this, you can go ahead and check that video out. But the long story short is that it isn't night and day in real world use. So you don't need to cover this device if you already have a Tab Ultra or a Tab Ultra C. But if you are in the market for a new productivity device, one that can replace a lot of what you do on a laptop, and be a good reader and note taker, then you should buy this one in that category of device at least. The only place that I've scored the Pro model higher than the original is in the design because there is an improvement in the placing of the pogo pins, which are now on the back. And with the look of it, this metal finish to the camera bump, for instance, replaces the clear plastic. Not everyone's favorite features. <laughs> you've got that slightly thinner body and you've got the slightly smoothed edges so they're less sharp in your hand. However, for most people, in any case, the design is not gonna be as enticing as the Note Air 3C. And I've got a full comparison of the Tab Ultra C Pro with the Note Air 3C. But long story short, I personally prefer this form factor, but it is a personal choice. This is my full review of the Tab Ultra C Pro. And before I make these reviews, I use these devices for a minimum of two weeks in my professional life. I'm a teacher. And so you can be sure that I've thoroughly tested out the device and it does perform as I say it does in the real world. They have added volume buttons here on the side which can be configured individually for different apps. Your options are volume scrolling or page turn. Although the main app that I would find that useful in, Kindle, I've yet to get page turn to work. They've also added a trackpad, which we have a little configuration, a boost in sensitivity, and remembering to put the screen mode into fast or ultra fast mode works really well and more on that later in the review. This is not a cheap device. It is one of the more expensive being tablets, but I personally think it's an absolute bargain. Why do I think such an expensive device is a bargain? Well, because the e-ink screen itself isn't cheap. Licensing the Wacom pen input, that isn't cheap either. And this time the higher end Snapdragon system on chip, that puts it a cut above the rivals and it does justify that bump in price. Check out the latest price in the links in the description, either at the bookstore or Amazon. 
because it might have changed since I filmed this video. It is a full on recommendation from me with a little warning. Compared to other ink tablets, books devices do have a steep learning curve. And this is because you can do more on the device. There are necessarily therefore more settings, more options, more settings to get right, and of course more settings to potentially get wrong. For example, in the Neo Reader app, which is the default book reader and PDF reader, and where I do actually most of my note taking and all of my planning, it's capable of so much. It's such a powerful reader with excellent annotation features, scaling features and different screen modes which may suit photographs or graphics or text. It's an incredible app for reading and learning but on the surface of it it is very complex. So if you buy this device be prepared for that steep learning curve. That being said if you're happy on Android then you will probably be happy here. It does have those familiar Android home, recents and back buttons and they can be shown like they are there or you can configure to use gestures to use those. The second warning is the battery life. It is not going to perform as well as a traditional e-reader or even some of the other e-ink tablets that are out there which will last for two weeks or so. It's not going to perform that well because you are going to do more than just read on it and generally using apps like Chrome or indeed Space Desk, they are going to use much higher refresh rates and so they're going to use your battery up much more rapidly. And that's because forcing that screen to refresh many times per second, moving the ink inside the little ink capsules many times per second, that is going to use a lot of energy. Whereas in a reading app, you're only having to use the screen refresh every page turn. And so you will still achieve pretty good battery lives in normal reading apps. So that's the thing. Although it does look absolutely amazing in apps like Chrome, you are going to be taking a hit on your battery life. Let's say it looks amazing and then it looks like that. So I've got this dark color enhancement right off. Let's go back to defaults. So a reading app like Kindle is only having to refresh the screen once every page turn. And you can even disable the page turn animations to make it even more battery friendly. I have talked a lot about this Kaleido free screen being darker than a black and white screen. And so it is true that you need to run in a lot of situations the front lights on at least half, normally even up to two thirds, to get a kind of white background look. And again, that means a drop in the length of time the battery lasts for. But I've actually been trying to run the device as far as I can with basically zero light on it. And it has been zero light the entire time in this video so far. And in fact, if you embrace natural light, if you try and sit near windows or use desk lamps, I'm surprised actually of how quickly I got used to having no front lights on. Got a little bit of glare there, but I certainly can't see it from the angle that I'm on here. And that's doing a really good job of illuminating this space along with my video lights as well. And personally, I'm now achieving three days of using the device. I use it sporadically, but I use it all day. Which is good, but it's not great in the world of e-ink. The trackpad, in fact, is really useful. It's really useful, not in an app like Kindle, of course. It's really useful, for example, when I'm using the browser version of X Tiles, because moving the tiles around, making new tiles is just so much more intuitive. It's the way it's meant to be, with a pointer rather than with tapping on the screen. So anything which is expecting more of a kind of point and click rather than just a tap, you're going to find that works quite nicely with the trackpad. And I have been finding that I'm more often using the web versions of apps. And you can see things like Although that is going to vary in different apps of whether they're designed to work with clicks or long presses, as most Android apps will be expecting. But anything which is designed for kind of click and drag, I think you're going to find that easier with the trackpad. And in any case, now you've got more options. I really like using the voice recognition, although one frustrating thing about that is that when you're editing with the keyboard, the spacebar starts and stops it. So whenever you try and edit bits of it, then you accidentally restart it with the spacebar. What I've been using recently has been the Google voice typing keyboard, which doesn't start and stop with the spacebar. And that was actually built in. It was pre-installed. You can also toggle whether the on-screen keyboard is shown at all. And you can choose very quickly between the input methods that you've got on the device. When it's on, then you've got access to the voice typing or the handwriting recognition. And when it's off, you've got more screen real estate just to type away. What they should perhaps look at is some kind of free floating voice recognition thing. Much smaller, not taking up so much space on the screen. And the works really seamlessly when you're using the keyboard. Just in general, I think the books could take a little bit more time to consider what it's like using the device when you have got the keyboard open, as opposed to when you've got it closed like a notebook. One thing I really love is comments from you guys in the audience, and sometimes they really influence the content. 
And one comment recently pointed out that the Tab Ultra C Pro has shaved 30 grams from the previous model, then added 100 grams to the keyboard case. So the keyboard case is now actually more heavy than the device itself. And what's more, they've taken 30 grams away from the battery in the Tab Ultra C Pro, and the battery is really where that extra weight is needed. And so now the whole package weighs over 900 grams. And I have already gone on record as saying the only real reason to buy this tablet over other comparable books devices is that keyboard case. So you wouldn't want to do without it. It became quite the talking point in the Grudge Match live stream where we compared the Note F3C and the Tab Ultra C Pro. This is not far behind the weight of a small laptop. And I've had other comments that have made a sensible suggestion that books can maybe add some battery capacity built into the keyboard case. But that would be getting ridiculous with how heavy this would become. That being said, it does weigh just less than the iPad Pro 11 and the Magic Keyboard is a heavier accessory still than this keyboard. That's probably a more relevant comparison than between this device and the laptop. However, it suffices to say that if you've got any wish to use this as a handheld reader for any length of time, it's probably best to look elsewhere. So that being said, this is more of a tabletop. Sure, it's a portable e-ink productivity device, but it's probably not an in-your-hand sort of notebook style device, in which case, why the Books Tab Ultra C Pro and why not that iPad with its magic keyboard or indeed the MacBook Air or any small and light Chromebook or PC? Well, the answer is in the e-ink screen. This device is probably for the already initiated. Those amongst you who are already aware and have experienced the benefits of using e-ink for note-taking and for reading more than just Kindle fiction books. It's for the people who are certain of those benefits, the eye comfort and for the use in all lighting conditions and for battery life, and who now want to expand to be able to do so much more on that amazing reflective screen. For those of us who fit that bill, once you do have this form factor in your life, you'll struggle to go back to not having it. It does this supremely well. The extra processing power and the extra RAM compared to its rivals make it faster at switching between apps and at handling more intensive tasks. And the keyboard case makes it faster too. For example, I really like this shortcut to split screen that they've added this time. The trackpad gestures can be really useful if you take the time to learn them. So there's three fingers up, that's home. Three fingers down is back. Three fingers left or right switches between apps. And four fingers takes a screenshot, although I've yet to get that one to work. But there is a function key shortcut for screenshot though. These are all good additions to make this a more useful productivity device. And more and more often, I'm finding myself working in the web app versions of cloud apps. For example, Xtiles, where I keep all of my type notes, or indeed the web versions of Microsoft 365 apps. And given that there is still variability on how different apps behave here on the ink screen by the book super refresh technology, it's a good thing that you can do so much within Chrome because that app works really well. And these are some of my personal documents, my personal OneDrive, but I could just as easily be signed into my work OneDrive here, my work 365 account. I can also have separate full versions of the Android apps for my own personal login and for my work login. That's the benefit of this device over some of your other e-ink tablets. It's your place to access and continue working on all of your cloud documents, wherever they live online. Of course, Microsoft 365 works just fine, but Google Drive for Docs, Sheets and Slides, that works just fine too. And in making these scripts for these videos, I am using a real mix of different platforms. I'm voice transcribing on my phone. I'm adding notes to pages in Xtiles on here, on my phone and on my computer, whichever computer I'm at. I'm compiling on my desktop PC into Google Drive and then I'm editing it down on the Tab Ultra C Pro on that same cloud copy. And then I can just download it directly to my teleprompter from Google Drive and boom, content. There's no workarounds. There's no emailing it to yourself or downloading from bespoke cloud managers or managing versions. And that's what it's like trying to integrate other e-ink tablets into your workflows. This just fits straight into your existing workflows. And with that use case, the only thing you might find yourself missing would be a direct 4G or LTE connection. Or perhaps because it is that good, this form factor in a 13.3 inch tablet. That would give you that true split screen real estate. And that's my lasting feeling about this device. I love it. Using it is a real pleasure. 
but I am aware as I do so that I'm experiencing a stage in an experiment that probably there'll be another stage in this development process that books are going through at the minute. Maybe there'll be another three or four stages as they iterate on this form factor. It might be that long until they reach a mature design. You have here what I consider to be the best ink tablet that you can buy, but it isn't an endpoint. It isn't all that it hopes to be yet. But if you're the type that likes to be at the very forefront of where this technology is right now, then this is for you. But if you're waiting for a true and fully functioning e-ink PC, you might be wise to enjoy watching books innovate and enjoy this public experiment and know that it's on the way, but we're still a few generations from perfection. For now, this is the best you can buy. Check it out in the links in the description. So that's it, that's a wrap currently on my findings for the Tab Ultra C Pro. I mean, what a great device it is. I have really, really enjoyed using it. And currently, this is your best bet. If you want something that's gonna give you a laptop style experience, this is the option for you. Fingers crossed what we see next from books is a development on this. But if you want to be part of the experiment, this is currently the place to be. Thanks so much for watching. And there's more comparison videos with these and other e-ink tablets here on the site.